All right, so thank you for having me. Today I'm going to be talking about some of the dermatologic issues you may encounter in uh, IBD. Uh, I have no conflict of interest, and I just want to point out that most of the treatments I'll discuss for pyoderm and gangrenosum are considered off-label. Um, so extraintestinal manifestations are common in IBD, as Dr. Jan already mentioned, and the skin is one of the organs that is most commonly affected. So I definitely don't have time today to talk about all the different uh, cutaneous diseases you may encounter. So I've included this uh, table that categorizes uh, the different cutaneous diseases into four nice groups. Uh, the first is disease specific, so that would be Crohn's disease occurring in the skin, either contiguous with the gastrointestinal tract or metastatic to it. And then reactive skin conditions that are thought to share a pathogenic link to IBD and arise secondary to the uh, dysregulation in the immune system. The third category are associated conditions. So these don't share pathogenic link, but occur with a greater prevalence in patients with IBD. And then the fourth is uh, treatment-induced uh, skin disease. So today I'm really going to be focusing on treatment-induced skin disease, specifically on anti-TNF therapy and psoriasiform dermatitis. And then I'll touch on pyoderma gangrenosum. So uh, just generally, cutaneous complications are very common in anti-TNF therapy, with about 20 to 30 percent of patients experiencing some sort of complication. The most common ones are infection, typically a staph or strep, uh, folliculitis or impetigo, psoriasiform dermatitis, and then eczema. And I know everyone wants to see photos in derm, so I've included um, three photos here of the most uh, common complications, with the bacterial folliculitis, um, all the way on the end there, psoriasiform dermatitis in the center, and then a typical presentation of eczema flecting the uh, flexural surfaces. So these are the, this is the popliteal fossa pictured here. Uh, the median time to appearance of these rashes is typically 1.9 years, so uh, after initiation of therapy. So it does take a while for these uh, complications to arise. And uh, what I will note is that, and what'll, this will come up in kind of future slides, is that there does seem to be some variability depending on what anti-TNF agent you're using. So some of them do tend to appear a little bit faster. Uh, some of the most common risk factors that are reported in the literature for developing a cutaneous complication while on anti-TNF therapy is uh, female sex, Crohn's disease and smoking. But what I will point out um, is that in a study by Kleinan et al., and the reference there is at the bottom of the slide, uh, they actually looked at, the, so far to date, they've looked at the largest cohort of IBD patients on anti-TNF therapy and looked at cutaneous complications. And they actually saw no correlation between sex or IBD type and the development of those complications. They did see a correlation between smoking and palmar plantar pustulosis, which is considered a variant of psoriasis. However, that correlation exists in the idiopathic form of the disease as well, so not likely related to anti-TNF therapy at all. All right, so focusing in on psoriasiform dermatitis, I'm going to show you photos now, and um, I'm going to show you photos of psoriasiform dermatitis, psoriasis, and palmoplantar pustulosis, which are all often categorized into one group, um, either psoriasis or psoriasiform dermatitis in the literature, but they all do look uh, distinct from one another, at least to me. So, <laughs> so in this, uh, first in this slide, uh, you'll see photos of psoriasiform dermatitis, so named psoriasiform because it is psoriasis-like, but does not quite meet all the clinical and histologic features of psoriasis. It tends to have a bit of an overlap between eczema and psoriasis. Like eczema, the, um, the lesions tend to be less well-defined. Um, they have this red-orange color, and then they have a little bit of scale. So comparing that to classic psoriasis, and you can see here the lesions are much more well-demarcated, and they tend to have that really silver um, micaceous scale. Uh, the areas of predilection for psoriasis tend to be the scalp, the extensor surfaces, so like the elbows and the knees, and then the sacrum. So palmoplantar pustulosis is considered by some to be a variant of psoriasis and by others to be its own disease entity. Um, it is characterized by recurrent crops of sterile pustules uh, that as they age, they turn a kind of red-brown color. They tend to appear on a red um, patch or erythematous patch with a lot of scaling, and it uh, has a tendency to affect the thenar and hypothenar eminences of the hands, as well as the medial and lateral aspects of the feet and then the arch um, of the foot. So kind of, uh, these are good photos showing all those features. 
So really, how common is psoriasis or psoriasiform dermatitis in IBD patients on anti-TNF therapy? And I've included in this table um, the four largest cohort studies kind of looking specifically at this issue. And uh, you can see that the prevalence range is anywhere from 1.7% to 10%. Now, that bottom study um, by Puglis et al. kind of looks like an outlier with a much higher prevalence, right? But what I will tell you is that study I mentioned before um, uh, by Clannan et al., and then very, another large study out of France um, that looked at overall the number of uh, the different variety of cutaneous complications that occur in anti-TNF um, therapy. And both of those studies actually did show a prevalence about uh, 10%. So that seems to be uh, uh, accurate. So uh, infliximab is the anti-TNF agent that is most commonly reported to cause psoriasiform dermatitis. But what I will say is that that probably just like reflects the fact that it's been around for longer and is more commonly used. So I'll point out the Afzali study, which is the second one down, and that comes out of University of Washington. And they actually showed a higher prevalence of psoriasiform dermatitis with adalimumab and sertilizumab. And then they showed a shorter duration of therapy before the onset of the rash. So 10 months compared to you know, the previously quoted 1.9 uh, years. Um, what I will say about that is that the uh, rheumatology literature actually shows similar data with a higher prevalence of uh, psoriasiform dermatitis arising with adalimumab use. All right, so the big question is, what can you do for these patients? Uh, the good news is, is that the majority of these studies did show that with the addition of skin-directed therapies, these patients can continue on their anti-TNF therapy, with about 50% of those patients being able to ma be managed with topical therapy alone. Um, up to 80% can, uh, can stay on their anti-TNF therapy with the addition of more aggressive skin-direct therapy. And in these studies, uh, the skin-directed therapy is really kind of broadly termed in that it includes topical or an oral corticosteroids and then other immunosuppressants like azathioprine and, uh, and methotrexate. But the great news is, is that uh, you know, most of these patients will be able to stay on their therapy. So a big question is, is what about switching anti-TNF agents? Um, will that help their psoriasiform dermatitis? Is this really a class effect? And the data would really suggest that it is. Um, so again, going back to those four studies, um, you can see that anywhere from 26 to 60 percent of the patients um, had to actually stop um, their anti-TNF, stop or change their anti-TNF therapy because of their psoriasiform dermatitis. And of those who are retried on a new anti-TNF, um, 50 to 100 percent of them develop the psoriasiform dermatitis again, so it would suggest that it is a class effect. So what about the addition of other immunosuppressive agents? I know methotrexate is one that is commonly added to, um, to control the psoriasiform dermatitis, and I would say that anecdotally it does help, um, but there is no good evidence one way or the other um, that it is necessarily useful. Ustekinumab, um, however, as you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Jan already went over kind of monoclonal antibody against IL-12 and 23, ustekinumab has been shown to be effective in not only uh, treating severe refractory anti-TNF psoriasiform dermatitis, but also in managing IBD symptoms. And uh, this slide just shows you that I'm not up to date on my uh, GI literature, as I did not know it was FDA approved for the treatment of IBD. So. Um, so that actually would prove to be a really good option for patients who develop severe um, uh, anti-TNF-induced psoriasiform dermatitis and need another option to, uh, for management of their IBD and their skin disease. All right, so my take-home points on anti-TNF therapy is that one, that cutaneous complications are really common with about one in four patients ex experiencing some kind of complication. Um, as always, you should refer early to dermatology for skin-directed therapy to help avoid discontinuation of their agent. And switching between agents uh, does not seem to be effective in managing their psoriasiform dermatitis. So I'm going to move on to the second part of the talk, um, pyoderma gangrenosum. As you know, pyoderma gangrenosum is a neutrophilic dermatosis. Um, it's thought, its etiology is thought to be multifactorial, related to genetic predisposition, neutrophilic dysfunction, and then an imbalance in the innate immune system leading to an auto-inflammatory state, and hence its uh, pathogenic link to IBD. Uh, to IBD. 
50% uh, of patients who uh, develop PG have some sort of underlying condition, with IBD being the most common, but then arthritis and hematologic malignancies being the other types. Uh, there are five clinical variants, uh, with classic, peristomal, and pustular being the types you most commonly see in association with uh, IBD. So here is a photo of what we all think of when we think of uh, uh, pyoderma gangrenosum. So the classic ulcerative type often starts as a tender pustular nodule that rapidly expands to this well-demarcated ulcer with the violaceous edge. And you can kind of see that, and I've circled that in the photo. You can really see the, um, that erythema uh, in that et wound edge. It does most frequently occur on the lower extremities, but really can occur anywhere on the body. Um, some patients even get pyoderma gangrenosum on the face, um, and that is, that's typically more common with hematologic malignancies than it is with uh, IBD. Another um, kind of characteristic appearance to these PG lesions is the cribiform um, appearance at the periphery of the wound, either in an expanding lesion or even in a healing lesion. And again, I've circled that there, and that's kind of that Swiss cheese looking to, look to it. Uh, pathology occurs in about 20 to 30 percent of patients. That's where ulceration forms at the site of trauma. And pain is a characteristic pa uh, feature with a lot of patients complaining that even air on the wound is exquisitely painful. Um, the resolution of pain is oftentimes the first sign that the patient is responding to therapy well before the, the ulcer starts to heal. So peristomal PG has all the same clinical features as um, the classic form, just occurs around a stoma, so almost exclusively occurs in patients with IBD. And the mean time to onset um, has been reported to be about 5.2 months after uh, the formation of the stoma. And peristomal irritation, um, so fecal leakage, uh, can contribute to pathogen. And what I've seen in a lot of patients, not necessarily with peristomal PG, but with other forms of PG, is that they think that the um, lesions have arisen because of infection or they're not keeping the area clean. And so they will do all sorts of things, you know, using hair dryers, using paper towels, packing things in there. And a lot of what they're doing to the wound to try to keep it clean is actually contributing to pathogen. So uh, pustular PG is the third type associated with IBD, and you, um, it most commonly occurs on the legs and appears as sterile pustules surrounded by a red halo and um, can often progress to the classic form. So how common is PG and IBD? Well, in this uh, cohort study of 2,402 patients with IBD, they actually found that it isn't that common, with less than 1% of patients uh, having PG. They saw no difference between um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease in terms of prevalence, and no association between the severity of the, the IBD and the likelihood to develop PG. And they, they found that the two diseases don't usually follow a parallel course. Um, interestingly, 22% of uh, cases of PG preceded the diagnosis of IBD. So for us in dermatology, when we see a patient with PG who has no known underlying systemic uh, disease, you know, in addition to evaluating them for the other conditions that can be associated with it, uh, we'll often, you know, refer to GI for evaluation of subclinical IBD, and you can, you can tell me if that's the right thing to do or not, but that's what we do do. All right, so PG is really a diagnosis of exclusion. There are no diagnostic criteria for it. The most important thing is to rule out other causes of cutaneous ulcerations. So for us in dermatology, a biopsy is essential. We always biopsy to look for, um, for infection. We'll send for tissue cultures, and then to look for uh, vasculitis or vasculopathy, in addition to doing blood work to assess for those, uh, those conditions. As I mentioned, uh, we screen for other underlying conditions. And what I would say to you guys um, is that obviously you'll have your patients with IBD who then go on to develop PG, and they have that known association, but I wouldn't look over the possibility that they've developed something else, you know, particularly a hematologic malignancy or a monoclonal gammopathy or even pregnancy. So to definitely evaluate the patients for the possibility that a different um, uh, disease has arisen. Okay, so treatment. What can be done for these patients? Um, treatment is really twofold. The first step is to control inf inflammation, and then the second step is to heal the wound. All right. 
So topicals are always, um, are always used in the management of pyoderma gangrenosum, um, um, although they're rarely used as monotherapy. Uh, there was a group out of the UK that did look at, um, did, that did show successful treatment of PG with monotherapy alone. Uh, what they did find was that the uh, most significant predictor for wound healing had to do with the size of the ulcer, with obviously smaller ulcers being more likely to respond. And their uh, mean uh, size, ulcer size, was uh, 4.7 centimeters. The most common topicals that are used are clobetazole and tacrolimus. And this is typically applied to the uh, wound edge, so to that inflamed border, and not usually applied to the actual uh, ulcerated bed. One thing that I would like you guys to note is that topical tacrolimus um, and its, uh, its cousin, pimecrolimus, um, can be very successful. And there's a lot in the literature about it being su su successful for peristomal um, PG. But the medication can be readily absorbed through the ulcerated bed. And so patients can often reach serum levels of tacrolimus equivalent to systemic administration of the medication. So to, if you, you know, opt to use this, to do so with caution and to monitor those levels. I've included in this slide intralesional triamcinolone that I also do love to use uh, in patients with PG. I never use it as uh, monotherapy, and I do wait to use it before, uh, what, as I'm I wait to use it until a lot of the inflammation has been controlled as you run the risk of pathergy with the injections, but it can be a great adjuvant therapy. So what about systemic therapy? So every immunosuppressive medication under the sun has been used in pyoderma gangrenosum with variable effect. The only three medications that have been uh, really studied in this in randomized control trials are cyclosporin and prednisolone and infliximab. And uh, in the stopgap trial, uh, again out of the UK, they looked at 112 patients and found no difference between either treatment in terms of healing of uh, the wounds, with about 50% in both groups uh, having some healing by six months. Uh, the rates of adverse events were actually similar between groups, um, although there were more serious adverse ev events in the uh, prednisolone group, with infections being more common. So infliximab has also been studied in randomized control trial, and um, this group randomized 30 patients to receive either infliximab or placebo. And those who received infliximab, 46% um, of them did show improvement, with 21% uh, going into remission by week six. They found that um, PG lesions were more likely to respond to infliximab if the lesion had been present than for less than 12 weeks. And they actually saw no difference in response between patients who had PG and IBD and those who had no IBD. So I've included this, um, this slide here, not really to talk about in detail, but I actually think it's just a useful reference slide and you'll get the handout, so you'll have that there. This is a diagnostic and treatment algorithm that has been proposed by um, some dermatologists, a dermatology group out of UCSF. And what I like about this slide is that they really, they divide PG into small, slowly progressive lesions versus large, rapidly progressive ones, and kind of list all the possible treatments that you could use depending on the clinical characteristics of the disease. And it, then it does le uh, list the level of evidence as well behind those. Um, so I thought that this would be a useful reference for, for you guys later. How do we go back? There we go. So what are you looking for in terms of treatment and, ter and in terms of response? So in the first slide, you can see um, you can see that the patient has those inflamed, let's see if I can do this right here. You see that this inflamed violaceous edge really right over in here and right in here. Okay, and so this is before treatment. And we started her on prednisone and within two weeks you can see especially over here, a lot of that inflammation has already subsided. You know, she definitely still has some inflammation in here, but it's definitely not as pronounced as it was in prior treatment. So that's our first, you know, one of our first clues that yes, we're doing the right thing and they are responding to treatment. 
So once you get the inflammation controlled, then the next step is just wound healing. And this is the hardest, one of the hardest parts because these ulcerations become so big and it's just a matter of time and diligence to get these wounds to heal. Uh, we often see patients every two to four weeks, depending on how active their wounds are, um, to monitor the uh, progression of their lesions. And we measure the wound at every visit, particularly the depth, because it's often the depth that improves before the actual diameter improves. Uh, we counsel patients on smoking cessation, glycemic control, and then minimizing edema, um, particularly on the lower legs, all these patients will eventually develop some lower extremity edema because the amount of inflammation they had in their legs and that ed edema will, um, will impede wound healing. So it is important to get them into compressions once the pain and inflammation has been controlled. Then we monitor for, um, for super infection, which is really common again in these patients with Pseudomonas um, being a very typical culprit. Uh, gentle debridement can be very helpful. In the prior slide, you could see a lot of what we call um, fibrinous debris within the ulcer bed, and that fibrinous debris does impede wound, he wound healing, so sometimes it is necessary to actually remove that. So my take-home points on pyoderma gangrenosum is that um, it's not that common. Less than 1% of patients uh, with IBD will, um, will develop it, although I'm sure from your point of view it feels like a lot of them do. Uh, corticosteroid, cyclosporin, and infliximab have the most data for their use. And then treatment is often, um, will often require a multi-drug regimen and uh, diligent wound care and should be done with the assistance of a dermatologist. Thank you.